Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sim City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And tonight we are continuing our study of the book of Proverbs. Uh, we're going to begin at uh, chapter 19, verse 17, and then we'll see how long we can get in it, uh, how far along we can get in an hour. Uh, I'm happy to have with me tonight uh, Preet and uh, Eric. So I want to give each one a chance to just say hi to everybody uh, before we begin. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Hello again. It's me again, the hall mode. <laughs> Okay. That's, That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> See, you know, Bible study doesn't have to be completely serious all the time. No, you need laughter. <laughs> yeah, Brother Eric also not only brings humor and a lot of uh, uh, sentiment and, and love to the, the study, um, uh, but uh, I, I hope that everybody will subscribe uh, to Brother Eric's channel, it is D E H A L L M O, D Holmo, and this sister that's with us tonight, uh, her, she goes by Preet, and I am assuming is that the name of your YouTube channel too? Yes. Okay, please subscribe to her channel. I've just I've just become acquainted with her over the last week or so, uh, listening to her in her uh, defending the faith and argue against the. The heresies of Calvinism, and she's she's really doing a fantastic job. So please subscribe to both of their channels. Now we're going to go through this uh, like a verse at a time and discuss it. Uh, I'm a what they call a what Brother Joe Byron coined as a, a KJV firstist. So I like to look at the KJV first, but I don't draw a line and say I can't look at anything else. I, I may look at the Amplified or some other translation or a or a Bible commentary, or maybe I'll listen to Preet or Eric, I'll listen to them. Anyway, anything that can help me understand the verse better, I, I'm willing to consider it. But let's start by with the KJV, and it says in verse 17, He, hath, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he repay him again. Now, uh, I, I find myself having to repeat this concept over and over again because I realize that uh, some people watching now might be watching this video out of context. You, maybe you didn't watch us get through the first uh, 16, 17 chapters already. And so if you're watching it in that way, uh, you need just a little bit of foundation. See, all, all the books of the Bible basically are, are their history books. Their history and prophetic books. They tell us what's happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future and it's true history, real historical accounts of real people, real events, um, um, but Proverbs is not like a, a, a continuous story, it doesn't have a storyline that it follows. It's, it's a, a series of ideas to teach us virtue and, and wisdom. And so sometimes you'll have a single verse that uh, stands alone. It, it's just one thought that we get from the verse. The verse before it and the verse after it are completely different thoughts. They're not related at all. So uh, that's how it's different than these, uh, these other books. And in this case, uh, I'm not sure yet if this verse stands alone or if it's connected to the others. But let me ask you, whoever wants to, respond to that, first, that verse 17. So verse 17 was, uh, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. So I would correlate this with like if you have mercy on the poor, because our God is a merciful God, um, so if you have uh, mercy on the poor, you help them out, whatever, meet their needs, that uh, you're really doing that for God. And that goes back to what Jesus said in the New Testament when he said, as you did to the least one of these, you did it to me. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's how I take it. And then uh, whatever you sow, you shall reap. So if you sow mercy, you shall get mercy. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I like how you connected that to, to the verse uh, that uh, not only sowing and reaping, uh, but what was the first one you... I, sometimes I lose my train oh, of thought. After I, I correlated like a, he that hath a pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. So that reminds me of what Jesus said, as you did to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So God is always... Um, I mean, that's very consistent with what Jesus said. Jesus even took, like, the child and said that whoever is the least among you is the greatest. So I would say that people who are the least among us, um, not only that they're the greatest, also they have the greatest needs. They're the most neglected, too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad you thought of that. And the nice thing about it is, is, is uh, if, if I was studying these verses on my own, you know, I would have my own. I could, I connect it to one verse or another verse, another principle, but I probably wouldn't have thought of that one. And so I'm just happy that you, you connected the dots there, uh, brother Eric. Uh, what's your take on that verse and and uh, Sister Preet's uh, comment? Well, brother Luke and Sister Preet, uh, you covered that pretty much nine ways to Sunday, and there's nothing left for me to say. <laughs> right. Nine ways to Sunday. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I will. I will speak a little bit more about it. I, I did have some other ideas that that uh, uh, Preet uh, made me think about. Um, see, we we know that Jesus has already paid for our sins. Uh, so when I talk about sin right now, I, it's in the context of look. Our sins are paid for, so that that's that's settled, and we can rejoice in that. But sometimes people, when they uh, kind of think about what is sin, and uh, they 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 don't want to sin. I don't want to sin, but you know I still have the old man in me, and there's a struggle between the new man and the old man sometimes. But but people. You've heard the term easy believism. Well, I, I believe in easy believism. You know, it's easy to get saved. You just believe on the Lord Jesus. Uh, no religious works are required. But there's another term that uh, someone I know on YouTube invented. He called it easy legalism. And easy legalism are the people that think that, well, faith is not quite enough. you gotta, you got to change your life and you got to you know repent of your sins and turn over a new leaf and become religious and 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 stop sinning and but when you but their thought of what sin is is watered down it's like legalism but it's easy legalism instead of strict legalism and so when we're talking about this verse made me think of it because it's urging us really to help the poor now so sin sin is we know that if you commit do a bad act, then you've committed a sin. Uh, and we know that Jesus said that even if you thought of doing a bad act, you've already sinned in your mind and your heart. But there's also a sin of omission. And that's what this verse here is telling me. That it's urging us on saying, to help the poor. And if we have an opportunity to help someone and we don't do it, that's a sin of omission. So, I, I that's what you made me think of, Sister Preet, when you talked about whatever you do to the least of them. Any more comments on yeah. that before we go on? Ah, uh, that's all I had to say. That's what came to my mind. All right. Um, let me look at uh, let me see seventeen. Oh, okay. So, but it also says, "Lendeth unto the Lord." Um, and that which he hath given, will he repay him again? Um, I think this is talking about uh, our, our treasures that we're building up in heaven. And so when we do something good, like helping the poor, we are building up, storing up treasures in heaven, that, and we will take them out. When, when we get to heaven, it will be blessed with whatever we, treasures we've built up. And some people... Um, they think the works that we do are to, to earn heaven as a reward, but we know that's false. Heaven 
is a gift, not a reward. But we do get, get rewards after we get saved, we have a ministry, and the good things we do, we're building up these treasures. And, and we are urged by Jesus. He said, build up your treasures in heaven, uh, not on earth, where your moth and rust can destroy it. Uh, and so and we're also urged by the Apostle Paul when he talks about the Bema Seat, and, the, and, and the, where we are judged for our rewards. So the idea of doing good things and knowing that we're going to be get rewards for it is, is a valid thing. And some people poo-poo it like, you shouldn't even think about rewards. Well, you know, it's not really my motivation for doing it, but it's kind of like the icing on the cake. You know, I do something because I want to love people and serve them and help them. But on the other hand, in my mind, I'm saying, wow, Jesus promises us treasures too. Bef anything else before we go on? Yeah, and um, that's one thing... Uh uh, there was actually a Christian philosopher, uh, I forget his name at the top of my head right now, but this is something that he had, uh, this was a question that was raised to him by, I, I think it was either a non-believer or may have been just like an outright agnostic or an atheist, where he said like, you know, uh, when I do something good, I am not doing it to like get get uh, rewards from God or something. So my motivation purely for doing that is just because I want to do it. So Christians, when they do it because they they're trying to get rewards in heaven, then it's like they have like an alternative agenda to doing it. And I loved how the this Christian philosopher approached this uh, question so the charge that was made against Christians is like you guys don't have noble motives for doing good works so he approached it like this he's like look whether you're doing it for an, uh, he's like okay but uh, you are also doing it for a motive because you're trying to make yourself uh, m look good by your works, by doing that. So he's like, you can't just say, make a blanket statement that, oh, I have no motives. You certainly do. And he's like, uh, the way, the reason why uh, for Christians that really doesn't impact a whole lot, that yes, we are told that uh, there will be rewards in heaven and all that. But he's like, that actually sets a Christian more free to be able to entirely spend themselves in this life because they know that they will be rewarded in the next life. So they don't have to worry about themselves. God takes care of them. That's the assurance that they're given. Whereas from an atheist perspective, uh, this life is all they've got. So how much freely can they spend of themselves if this life is all they've got? And so how the philosopher answered it, he's like, that uh, a Christian worldview of that, you know, we've been given salvation, and not only that, that our treasure is really in heaven, that sets you free, totally free in this life to spend yourself on others, to really give genuine sacrifice of yourself. Why? Because you're not worried about this life. It is but a drop in the bucket. So you are more free to give of yourselves under that perspective than you are where your life just ends when you're dead and this life's all you've got. You've, you know what I mean? So I think he answered it very nicely that it, it that motive is actually set, uh, something that actually sets us free, totally free, to actually genuinely go out and spend ourselves on others. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, I've got some thoughts I want to respond to Preet, but uh, Eric, I don't want to give. I want to make sure you get an opportunity here. What's your What's your thoughts? Uh, I'm in agreement, absolutely, uh, because uh, freedom is one of the seven thunders spoken into the new creation. Okay, back to you. All right. <laughs> uh, Preet, when you're talking about motivation, uh, two things came to my mind. One was many, many years ago. Now, I, I don't... I don't know how much you know about me, but I've spent years doing street evangelism too, street preaching. And 
one guy asked me one time what my, what my motivation was. Was I doing it? Mm -hmm. He said, are you doing it um, for um, because to, to serve God, or are you doing it because you care about the people? You want them to go to heaven. You feel for them. You don't want them to be lost. Or are you doing it for rewards? And I said, well, I'm, I guess all of it factors in. I, I, I think that my primary reason is I'm, I want to serve the Lord. I mean, I want, uh, I want to talk about Jesus. I mean, to me, the most, the happiest time of my life is if I get to talk about Jesus and someone will listen, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, but the, the salvation of the lost, of course, is, is, is a primary importance, too. I couldn't really say I had one over the others as far yeah. as motivation. That's uh, what the philosopher said. He's like, uh, when Christians are out there doing, like, you know, feeding the poor or, like, doing any kind of uh, charity that you would consider good, they're, they're really not thinking about what they're getting in heaven they, that just for them salvation is such a big uh, gift alone that they're really yes they're told that you know you'll get re rewards and whatnot but most Christians really don't even think about that when they're out there it's not something that really crosses their minds a whole lot more than just I want to uh, just do God's will yeah, there was something else you said about this that made me think of the, uh, when, when Jesus said, uh, there's a person that when they fast, they don't wash their face. You know, they want you to know. When they pray, they do it publicly. They, they, they don't do it in the closet privately. And what they're doing is they, they, they want, they're getting a reward right now, which is recognition. They're getting recognized, and people are saying, oh, look, look how religious they are. But that, that motivation, you don't get treasures in heaven. You already got your reward, which is attention. You got attention for yourself. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you've mentioned heaven a couple of times. I, I did also a, wanted to say how, what you reminded uh, me also was how you said that, you know, the guy asked you, like, are you doing it because you want to serve the Lord uh, or are you doing it because you care for the people? Now, I would put that in a biblical context uh, in how Jesus said, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and, uh, heart, uh, mind and soul and you shall love your neighbor. So you... You cannot possibly love your neighbor, which is everybody except you around yourselves that you come in contact with, starting with your family to uh, all other per persons that you might meet. The love, per uh, love for another person is perfected precisely when your love first is directed towards God. It's only then can it be pure. Uh, it's like almost like God is like the refining of our love. Like so, if if we direct our loves uh, upward to Him, that He acts as like the refine. It, it refines our love. Then that, when it's poured out on other people, it it's more so loving and more robust and more um, genuine. That you, it's not possible to. I mean, yes, non-believers, I believe they love other people. But I believe there is a missing aspect that when that love can be refined so much more when God is your beginning point, like he's the first, he's the alpha. That's why Jesus says, first love him, then love your neighbor. Yeah, that's that's all true, and this is the time when Brother Eric wants to say something. I'm sure because because that's what he keeps reminding me of all the time is the royal law, Brother Eric. Wow, Brother Luke, I just had a wonderful revelation, uh, epiphany. Okay, now God has revealed His love to me in, throughout my life in three different means. In the beginning, when I was first born again, he revealed his love to me through experience. I experienced his love in a great way. Towards the middle of my life, he 
taught me how uh, he revealed his love to me in a lesson. It was a very difficult lesson. Very difficult lesson, but it was uh, sure. And now towards the end of my life, uh, he has revealed to me his love in a mystery. Okay, back to you guys. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I <laughs> the only thing I disagree with there is you're saying right now is the end of your life. I'd say you're more in the middle than your end <laughs> end right now. You're not you're not old. So you're like in the final final. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, love uh, is is so important uh, that Jesus condensed everything down to that. He says, "I'm going to sum it all up for you." You know, with this royal law, love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And uh, you know, um, he, he said, uh, love one another. Uh, and then Paul reiterates it. I think is it First Corinthians chapter. Uh, uh, let me see, thirteen or seven. That's the love chapter. But they, in, in Paul is talking about you can have all these wonderful qualities, but it means nothing without love. So yeah, it's it's that's how important it is, and, and that that's really what won me over to Jesus. I mean, some people uh, they put their faith in Jesus because they they want to be saved from the judgment and condemnation and hell. Uh, I wanted uh, my relationship with Jesus because I recognized how much he loved me and I couldn't help but love him in return. And of course, I don't have to be found guilty anymore either, so that's wonderful. But it was my first response to Jesus was based on his love for me. All right, we'll go on. Uh, okay, uh, verse uh, 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. And let not thy soul spare for his crying. <laughs> uh, any reaction to that? Um, that's pretty, I mean, for me, that's pretty straightforward. Chasten thy son while there is hope. So as we're raising our children, um, we should discipline them before they get to they're, they're like too far gone like you should not let the problem uh, escalate or a certain behavior uh, escalate you should always deal with it while yet it's only a small issue rather than letting it fester and fester and then when it uh, absolutely explodes into a big old mess, then you try to deal with it. And then uh, don't, uh, don't let your soul sp uh, spare for his crying. Yeah, children will uh, throw uh, temper tantrums. Like my little nephew, he, is, he just now uh, is two years old. Boy, does he throw temper tantrums. And you try, he, he's in that stage where like he will randomly like uh, he's being taught like to listen to com uh, like obey like okay come here sit here and like no you're not gonna get your way so we're trying to teach him that and he's learning but he'll throw temper tantrums and he'll hit you back and you have to discipline him like that's not okay and he needs to learn that now you can't just let it say like oh he's just a kid he'll get better no, there has to be a continual uh, re, uh, reassertion of discipline and appropriate behavior in so far that he learns it now so he doesn't get... Well, you don't deal with things when they get worse. You deal with them from the very beginning. That's what a uh, responsible parent would do. Works for me. Yeah. You know, as we've been going through Proverbs, you know, there's been a lot of references to your son. You know, because uh, it's it says in the beginning that uh, Solomon wrote these Proverbs to teach his son wisdom. And then throughout it, there's references as how to deal with your son. 
and I happen to have a son, and he's 35 years old now, and I, I you know, I, it seems like I'm just bragging about him all the time because I'm very proud of him. Um, so people might get tired of me always talking about him in that way, but there were a couple of times when he was a little boy that I spanked him. And you know the idea of, uh, they say that, you know, this is going to be hurt me more than it hurts you. Uh, that, that was really true, I think. I mean, I mean, it did hurt him. He cried. I spanked him with a, a paddle a couple of times on the butt. You know, it wasn't real severe or anything, but it was enough so that he knew he was punished for something. But to do it was hard. But I, I knew that I had to do it because I loved him. I understood that, uh, as it says in Hebrews, uh, because we're a child, God, his, a child of God, God will discipline us. He will chastise us. And it's because we are his child. If we are bastards, the word, I think it uses the word bastard or illegitimate. Uh, and it says if, if we were bastards, not real, a child of God through faith in Jesus, then there were, he, he wouldn't chastise us. But because we are a true child of God, because of our faith in Jesus, then it, it, it is God's duty to chastise us. It's an act of love. Of course, some people, I mean, I recently on the news, someone was doing that and going to such an extreme, they killed one of their children in a church. I, it was all over the news just this last week. So some people... Oh, my God, I didn't hear about that. What happened? Um, I don't... I, it, to me, it seems like it's some kind of extreme cult type of thing, kind of like the West Westboro Baptist type people that are probably we wouldn't even associate with, but um, the, there were two parents and a son and then a brother or a, or a sister and uh, the son was in the church being physically punished uh, severely and telling they must get, repent of their sins and, and punishing them and uh, it, they went so far that they ended up killing them and there are others that are being charged with murder and uh, so obviously uh, there is a certain degree that we go to that is not going to like, and there was a football player that got in trouble the last couple of years for beating his child uh, and, and so severely that it left welts all over him. And, I mean, he, people can go too far with this, but then you can also err the other way and just do nothing, and then your child is ruined. Uh, spoiled is the word. They're ruined. They're, they're no good because they don't understand uh, that there's consequences and then they end up doing really bad things and <laughs> they go to prison because they never learn consequences uh, for little things. Uh, all right, that's, uh, that's all my thoughts. So I'll go on unless you want to say anything further. No, I'm good. All right. Uh, okay, now we're on verse uh, 19. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment for if thou deliver him yet thou must do it again okay um, this is this is an example of something that is uh, written in such a way that I can't really speak with confidence that I can really understand that it's like to me that that verse is like a riddle yeah, I, uh, that's what I, I mean, the first verse, a, gr a man of great wrath shall suffer punishment, uh, but then the follow-up uh, line, the second sentence, for if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it, that, uh, that kind of throws me in a tizzy, I don't know what to make of it. I find that a lot of times when I'm stumped, and, and you know, I, I again, uh, preach, you know, I'm just getting to know you, but uh, all, you know, all all this last week of listening to you, uh, I, I'm very impressed with your um, your articulate and, and your ability to communicate is a high level. And so I, I know that you know you're not someone that doesn't understand, have a good vocabulary, so you can't understand something. I, I I'm educated. I have a good vocabulary, but sometimes the KJV just stumps me, and that's why I'm yeah. amplified or some other. Uh, some people can't stand the fact that I would look at another translation, but uh, sometimes I feel, feel that 
I, I think sometimes you have to because it's just worded in such a way. I'm going to look at it in the Amplified, but first I want to give Brother Eric a chance to teach me because a lot of times, oh, Brother Luke, this is simple. This is real easy. He seems to get it. KJV is right up his alley, I think. Go ahead, Brother Eric. Well, guys, I need you guys to figure out exactly what that means and what the punishment is because I'm that man of great anger. Okay, get to it. Okay, let me read it in the Amplified and see if it's helpful to us. Okay, verse uh, 19, I think, yeah. Uh, man, see, what the Amplified does, by the way, is that it's really like a commentary. It's taking the verse and putting it in words, and it's adding words, that, and it's amplifying. Amplifying means is that you, you're expounding further. Instead of just taking the, it as it is, you're explaining it. So it says, a man of great anger will bear the penalty for his quick temper and lack of self-control. Well, that's we, we could all see that, and that didn't need to be explained to us. But then the rest of it says, For if you rescue him and do not let him learn from the consequences of his action, you will only have to rescue him over and over again. Well, that that certainly, uh, you know, I can certainly understand that principle. Uh, now, yeah, that's a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's discuss it from that context here. I'll read the second part again. It says, uh, if you rescue him and do not let him learn from the consequences of his action, that means is that, that okay, hey, somebody does something bad and you let them off the hook. You You don't. Uh, it's like getting back to the last verse, you know, you didn't discipline your child. They didn't learn anything from it. Uh, and, and therefore, they're going to repeat it again, and the consequences, since there were no consequences, it'll happen over and over again. And it may escalate to something even much more serious, I think. So uh, I'll read it one more time and then get your thoughts on it. If you rescue him and do not let him learn from the consequences of his action, you will only have to rescue him over and over again. Okay, what's your response to that? Yeah, sometimes you have to um, let them deal with the consequences that they've incurred. Because it's like almost like you know, if you do, you see this happening. Like, for example, I'm going to use the celebrity culture. You see these celebrities. And you see these celebrities and their kids. Their kids are like Lindsay Lohan, and like you see all these people, and they're constantly getting in trouble, get, get going to jail multiple times. Their parents are rich; they can bail them out. What happens? They end up doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, exactly. The thing that is interesting is if you rescue them. Uh, that to me, I thought of rescuing them as as uh, as a good thing. But the way it's the Amplify explain rescuing them is really a bad thing. You're, when you rescue them, you're you're letting them get yeah. off, get away with it. You're st you're trying to spare them from um, the consequences that they have uh, rightly incurred. Like for example, like the celebrities, uh, they'll bail their kids out. Why? Because they've got money, they've got influence, they got power. So the kid never got to. Uh, experience the consequences of their actions. Sometimes you have to let your children uh, face the consequences. Why? Because they will uh, teach them a lesson. It, it, it'll be a bitter lesson, but sometimes there are some lessons in life that have to be learned uh, through bitter pain. Yes. Yeah, but uh, this is one of the things about being a parent that is difficult, to, and that is that um, you you want to spare them any kind of consequences and suffering mm -hmm. pain because you love them. To me, the, the 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 worst thought that ever comes into my mind is the thought of my son dying or being seriously harmed in some way. Uh, to me, the, it's uh, the most tragic thing in the world is is uh, is for a child to predecease the parent, and 
So you, we love our children so much, we want to protect them so much, but sometimes that's not the right thing to do. It's not the wise thing to do. Brother, Brother Eric, should we really start cracking down on you a little bit more so we're not rescuing you and maybe you can get over this rage that you have in you? Well, there's still too much mystery shrouded in that verse to me, in my opinion. What would be the great wrath? What would be the punishment? And what? How would how would you rescue somebody from that? It's all it's all just a big mystery. Let me let me read it again in the amplified, and I I think to me uh, it. There's no mystery uh, the way it's written there. It says, a man of great anger will bear the penalty for his quick temper and lack of self-control. But if you rescue him and do not let him learn from the consequences of his action, you will only have to rescue him over and over again. Uh, I can relate to that in terms of debt. Sometimes I've helped people with their debt and uh, they didn't learn their lesson. They just go back in debt again at the end because they, you bailed them out, you know. So, uh, brother, are you still uh, not confident in, in understanding that yet? Well, uh, I'm still wondering. It says specifically great wrath. Now, that's got to mean something, great wrath. Wrath is anger for a person who has a lot of anger in great, them. Great wrath. Can you think of any examples of great wrath? Uh -huh. Only God has great wrath, doesn't he? No, no, I think man can have great wrath. I, I don't think we have to limit that to God. Uh, all right, well, I, I can't do any better than that, so uh, let me go back to the KJV in the next verse. Let me see. Back to KJV. And we'll look at verse 20. Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. And that latter end is not talking about your, your rear end, your buttock. <laughs> <laughs> it's talking about what Brother Eric was saying, how he's this like the end of his life, he thinks, but he's, he's still relatively young, I think. Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. So as we get older, uh, you know, you'll be wiser if you'll be willing to listen to counsel and, 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 and instruction. It's a pretty, pretty simple one, I'd, I'd say. Uh, there are a lot of these uh, verses and, and uh, lessons in Proverbs that are repeated over and over again. And uh, this is one that I love, and many times already, and many times ahead of us as we go through the study, we're going to see that we are urged to have counselors. A wise man has many counselors. Uh, a fool doesn't listen to people, you know. Uh, I'm thankful that I don't know how I learned it, I, I, but I'm thankful that at least I learned I, I'm willing to listen to people. For years I've listened to people who disagreed with me on theology, but I, I was able to, okay, let me hear them out. And there's been a few times where they persuaded me I was wrong and I joined that side of their the position because I was willing to listen. And, and uh, being uh, willing to listen to other people, to get counsel from people, it can't hurt. Uh, there's a saying that I like. It says, uh, you know, uh, preach, you know, you're entering all these debates here, but that this might be uh, something for everybody to consider. It says, remember why we debate. The only thing we have to lose are the errors that we hold. Uh, only a, who but a stubborn fool would hold on to errors once they've been exposed. So I've found that when I've been willing to debate people, and I don't usually do it in a public type of forum, a lot of my things have been like one-on-one -on -one privately behind the scenes, and uh, we've, we've argued various theological questions out, but it's been, it's been a very cordial type debate with respect and from courtesy towards each other, and uh, I listen. So sometimes they won me over. 
Sometimes I won them over to my side. Sometimes nobody was persuaded, but we didn't lose anything. We gained more understanding, at least. Uh, so this idea of being accepting counsel and, and instruction is, is one of, I think, one of the most important things a person can learn in their life. Do you have any counselors? Do you have uh, any? I mean, in general, do you, do you like to? Are you willing to listen to other people, and or do you have any trusted counselors that you you, you go to for counseling? Hey, brother Luke, uh, I just got a message from Pre on my phone. It says she'll be right back. Now, as far as what you were talking about. Of course, I've got my counselors, and everybody should have wise counselors, right? It's so important. But I, I wonder why you specified uh, that you would be wise at your latter end. What is he talking about? Why would we want to be wise at our latter end? Uh. I think that uh, you know, getting wisdom is a lifelong pursuit, and and uh, it takes a long time to, you know, a lot of people think that as people get gray hairs, they can get more wisdom. Gray hairs is just the indication of aging. So as we get older, do we get wiser? Well, I don't think it's universally true. There's some old people that are still quite foolish, uh, uh, but I think that's why it says in in the latter t time or whatever, however it's phrased there, uh, is that because if you listen to counsel, eventually as you get older, you're going to have more and more wisdom in your in your uh, latter years. Okay, uh, now look at let's look at uh, verse 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Okay, brother? Well, this is not one of those verses that you would uh, pretty much have to uh, contemplate on your bed in the middle of the night for hours to understand what, it, what are these devices in man's heart that he's talking about. Oh, hold the phone. You're muted. <laughs> okay. In my latter years, I'm not getting more wise about the mute button. <laughs> no, but it's always good for a few laughs. <laughs> okay, what I said is, okay, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified and see if that will help us at all. Let me try that. Okay, we're on verse uh, verse uh, 21. It, it says, Many plans are in a man's mind, but it is the Lord's purpose for him that will stand and be carried out. Uh, that's certainly much easier to understand. I don't see any contradiction there. And many devices or many plans... If you look up devices, I think you'll find plan is part of the definition. So, um, in, a, in a man's mind, we have many plans, but is the Lord's purpose for him that will stand and be carried out? That's right, brother. I remember the old English uh, definition for devices. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me go on here now. Uh, back to the KJV again. Verse 22, the desire of a man 
is his kindness. And a poor man is better than a liar. I don't know, brother. Uh, I agree with the second half, but I don't understand the first half. Uh, the desire of why would the why would the man desire be for kindness? It doesn't compute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I'll go right to the amplified and see what it says about it. Verse 22, that which is desirable in a man is his loyalty and unfailing love. But it is better to be a poor man than a wealthy liar. Okay, that which is desirable in a man is his loyalty and unfailing love. Okay, uh, we know that loyalty and unfailing love, faithfulness, uh, is a desirable quality. Uh, uh, it is better to be a poor man than a wealthy liar. What do you think? Would you rather be a wealthy liar or a poor man that's honest? Well, um, I've already made that choice. Now, as far as the first half, uh, very good, Charlie. It had just occurred to me that if you were a Southern gentleman, then your desire would be your kindness. Okay, back to you. Okay. All right, let me go back now to the KJV again. Verse 23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall... I'm sorry. Uh, I, interrupted. I interrupted you while you were reading scripture. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. But anyway, uh, that's one of the keys of David. Okay, I'm mining the keys of David out of uh, the Proverbs and the Psalms, and uh, I'll have my lawyers verify that they're accurate, and we'll uh, present them to the whole world. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Hold the phone. <laughs> You're, you're moody. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the, it says, The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. Now, we've talked a lot already about the term, the fear of the Lord. Uh, and again, you have these terms that are recurring, uh, these themes, these principles uh, that recur over and over again. And the fear of the Lord, uh, uh, the, that's the, the reverence and the respect for the Lord. Uh, now, you could fear the Lord in terms of fearing his chastisement. A person could fear the Lord in terms of their condemnation and the second death in the lake of fire. But, brother, you and I, and, and pre, we, we don't need to fear that. We're promised life everlasting in heaven. So we don't need to have that kind of fear. Uh, but the, res, uh, the respect of the Lord, our respect, uh, our reverence. And I've, I've talked about this before, too, but I, I think it's just, it just it breaks my heart when, when I hear people using the Lord's name in vain. And, and some people do it because they hate the name Jesus. They hate it. Some people do it that are actually professing Christians, and they do it uh, saying because they are not showing the reverence, the fear, the respect 
for the Lord that they that He deserves, and they use it casually, without. I never want to say the name Jesus in, in any in any way that is not in, with the utmost respect and reverence. Uh, but there are people that just use it, throw it in a sentence like, uh, as, as a, like a way of a, what do you call it, an intensifier. You intensify what you're doing by saying, "Oh Jesus." So that, to me, is the uh, fear of the Lord is giving the reverence to to the Lord and and particularly the name of the Lord, which is Jesus. Uh, what do you want to say about that, brother? Yes, brother Luke, that would be uh, rooted in love. Right? That fear is rooted in love, isn't it? Uh, it makes a pretty bold statement there saying that uh, uh, it, the fear of the Lord tendeth to life. In other words, for a person who respects the Lord and has this fear of the Lord, you tend to have life. Now, what does that mean, you to have life? Uh, uh, it means that you're not going to get sick and die. You're, you're not going to suffer in any way. You're not going to have poverty. You're going to have life. I think it's like an abundant life. You'll be blessed. And then it says, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. Well, that, that means you're satisfied. You're not lacking. You're not you're not uh, in poverty. You're not suffering. You you're satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. Uh, evil. I think I think evil is just basically any the bad things that happen. We we will tend to be protected. But we know that even the most most reverent people um, that fear the Lord uh, that. Uh, have complete admiration, respect, and reverence at all times for the Lord and His name, like the Apostle Paul that we talked about uh, yes, last night in our study on early church history. Uh, did, did anybody have any more fear of the Lord than Paul? That means reverence, respect. No, I don't think anybody did. But, but was he spared evil? He had a lot of evil, bad things happened to him over and over again. He had it coming against him on all sides. Uh, beaten with clubs four different occasions. Uh, getting 39 lashes three or four different occasions. Shipwrecked, snake bitten, stoned and left for dead, imprisoned, beheaded. So it doesn't mean that we're going to be protected from all evil our whole life, even though we all, we have the fear of the Lord. We revere God. We respect God. But that's not going to spare us persecution and suffering in our lives. Uh, okay, uh, I think I'll make that the last verse here. Let me get your response to all of that, and then we'll, we'll close out here. Absolutely, Brother Lee. And as far as one of the keys of David, those would be salvific verses hidden in the Old Testament. Now, that fear of the Lord can be compared to the godly sorrow that leads us to repentance and salvation. That definitely tends to life. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Hold the phone. You're muted. <laughs> I think that I might be setting a record tonight for talking with my mute on more often than ever. I think you caught me mute, talking muted, uh, you know, four or five times at least. Uh, I just made a note that we'll pick up our next study in Proverbs. We'll pick up with uh, uh, chapter 19, verse 24. We didn't cover that many verses, but I thought it was very, very uh, helpful. Uh, we, 
I, I've said this many, many times, but as we study all of the scriptures, we learn so much about theology, about God, and about history, and study Proverbs, we learn about wisdom. Uh, but all of it would really be meaningless, of no, really of no value to us, if, if we didn't learn what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, wisdom unto salvation. And I, that's since it's the most important thing of all, then, uh, you know, it's something I'm certainly not going to neglect. Right? We and all of our broadcasts, we want you to tell you what is of utmost importance, and that is, uh, do you want to go to heaven? It, now, I realize not everybody answers that question yes. I've had people tell me, no, I don't want to go to heaven. I'd rather go to hell. All my friends will be there. There's... Uh, we'll have a big party. Well, what you don't realize is that the party in hell was canceled due to the fire. Hell is not a big party. But if you don't want to go to heaven, fine. You can just turn this off now if you want. Okay. But and if but if you if you don't want to go to heaven, but you're curious about what do you have to do so you can go to heaven, then listen because maybe someday you'll have a different attitude and you say, Hey, I want to go to heaven. I I do believe there's life after death, and I want to go to heaven. Well, do you know how to get there? Do you know what you must do? I'm going to tell you now, because the whole world today and in all of history has been wrong about it. Almost the entire world believes that we go to heaven as a reward for our good behavior. All the religions of the world are based on this one premise. It's called the merit system. If you're a good enough person, God will judge you acceptable and let you into heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. And that's not what we call biblical Christianity. There's all kinds of people who profess to be Christians, and they don't know the most basic thing of all. They think that they can earn heaven if they're good enough. They'll get heaven as a reward if they're good enough. You can join all the religions of the world. You can become the most religious person. You can work and strive and try to get to heaven through your own efforts, and you're going to fail every time. It's impossible. Jesus said it's impossible. But with God, it's possible. On your own, it's not possible. You can get to heaven with God by putting your faith in God, who our Savior God, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you to reject the way that man thinks. Man's way is not God's way. Instead of trying to get to heaven through your own efforts, say, no, I, I, I can't do it. I would have to be perfect, and I, I can never be perfect. So now, instead, instead of believing in yourself, Instead of putting your faith in yourself and your own performance, reject that and now put your faith in someone else to save you. And there is only one Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So Jesus said he's the way. That's the way to get into heaven. He is the life. He is the one that has life everlasting to give you. He is the truth. He's the truth you need to know. No one can come to the Father but by me. He said he claimed exclusive of power to get you into heaven. He says he's the only way you can get into heaven. So you either believe him and trust him to do it, or you call him a liar and say, no, Jesus, you said you're the only way, but I don't believe it. I can get there some other way, through a, another a religion or through my own goodness. So either believe him and trust him, or call him a liar, or call him a lunatic, and say he was deluded. As for me, I believe him. The reason I believe him is because of the resurrection. Now, the Bible says Jesus is God, eternal God. He became a man so he could die for our sins. He died on the cross. He paid for all of our sins. But he didn't stay dead. After three days, he raised himself to life again. The resurrection. The resurrection is the proof, the sign, that gives us all confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. He really raised 
himself from the dead. He, he walked on the earth for 40 days. He ate with people. They touched him. And then he ascended up and he's in heaven now, waiting for us. He says he's preparing a place for us. So we're asking you tonight to do one simple thing. It's simple and it's easy. Stop trying to strive and work to heaven to get to heaven on your own. And reject that. And instead put your faith completely in Jesus. Trust him to do it. And if you put your faith in him, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because he promises everyone in life everlasting if you'll believe in him. So believe in him as your savior, as your savior God. All right, that's uh, all I got to say about that. Uh, let me see if Preet or Eric have anything they want to add before we move on. We will close our broadcast for tonight. That's right, Brother Luke. Someone once said, try it, you'll like it. That was Isaiah when he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's what Jesus says. Come and receive New life in Christ Jesus. Back to you, Brother Lou. Okay. Uh, I assume uh, Preet is uh, busy maybe making dinner or something for the family. I don't know. But uh, I want to thank Preet and uh, Eric for joining me tonight. And um, if you're watching this live, uh, thank you for, for watching. Uh, the, I'm attempting to do these broadcasts nightly, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. So we, we're kind of alternating between the book of Proverbs, the book of Job, the book of John, and a very interesting topic, early church history. So join us 7 p.m. Pacific time nightly. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.